So let, let's just um, kind of calibrate ourselves where we are here. We're trying to investigate what it means, emuna or faith. Uh, it's obviously very central in, 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 in the Jewish worldview. Uh, and it's very different than what society at large believes in. You know, society at large uh, doesn't like to talk about faith so much. You know, it's not something that people discuss. Uh, you know, it's very private, which is a way of saying we don't want to talk about it. Um, but in Judaism, it's, it's the center of our worldview. Uh, and what we uh, spoke about uh, in the past two weeks was that we have a very nuanced approach to emuna. Uh, and there's multiple levels, and we came up with there's maybe even ten different levels. And as we move up, we find different, ent- entirely different realms of, of Jewish living. So I, I, I want to dip our toe in, into this idea. Um, wh- what does it mean? The, you know, wh- what's the what's the base? What's the what's the Emuna 101 for uh, for Jews? So I, I I think we kind of talked about it last week, but just to recap, and then we go a little deeper. Um, where is uh, where it's a realization of the reality of the spiritual realm? You know, we have the soul that we can access, we can see, we can feel. Uh, yet it's a it's, it's an entire reality, it's an entire world, and how we choose to project our reality means what we choose to see as real and what we choose to see as not real, that determines who we are as an individual. Last week we mentioned about this upside-down world that we get to experience when we die. Everything's the opposite. And the reason why it's the opposite is because everything that we value, everything we, we prioritize over here, is centered about our reality. So whatever your reality is, that, you know, that's what dominates uh, uh, your, your perspective. You know, so most of us, or most of humanity... Uh, the default status is that we're bodies and we're material entities and therefore our priorities and our values are going to be in those realms. And we get to the next world and we see everything's upside down. right? The, the, obviously, once you're dead, your body and the materialism has no value. Of course, that we all know. That's the investment that's guaranteed to go to zero. <laughs> guaranteed. Right? It has for sure, for, that, that everyone has to agree. And sounds, sounds like options. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in Judaism, it introduces that there's a whole other world that is not limited to our status as a body, as who we are in this world, and that's the spiritual idea. And whatever we invest in that part of our existence, uh, we have forever. You know, like the Mishnah says, when someone dies, what accompanies him? Not his gold, not his silver, just your mitzvahs, just your good deeds. Because that's the only, th- that's the only uh, uh, possessions that we have that are spiritual possessions. You know? So that, that's what we can actually take with us. Now, emuna is a perspective. A perspective of what, what are we? What, what are we? What are, are our goals? Well, what's our reality? If we're able to change our perspective from this world to the next world, we have full, full-blown emuna. And along the way, where we make the spiritual reality more and more real, and more and more of what we truly value in lives, the higher we, we move the levels of, uh, of faith, of emunah. How do we do that? With mitzvahs. So a mitzvah is a crossover. When you do a mitzvah, you're doing something that is not necessarily beneficial for your body. Right? Mitzvah, you give charity. It, it's, it's the most illogical thing someone could possibly do from a body-centric perspective. You're taking money, which is the most valuable currency, and you're giving it away to someone else for free. You're not getting any goods in return. The only reason why someone would do that is because they're not doing it for their status, their standing as bodies, but rather they're standing as souls. It's a mitzvah. Now, just as a quick disclaimer, some people, they give the charity because they can have their name plastered on some building, or they can have everyone give them honor, which is a way for them to do a mitzvah, but with physical and material motivations. Now, in Judaism, the mitzvah is all about this idea, where we do something that only makes sense because we're souls as well as bodies. You know, so kindness, right? You're doing something good for someone else. You benefit. You don't benefit. Maybe you have a nice feeling about that, okay? Uh, but you don't really m- benefit materially in any way. Why would you take the time to do something for someone else? Right? You, you pray. Pray to the Almighty. That's something that's 
You know, we don't see the, the benefit, right? You don't see the return on investment in the form of what you get from your time, for your time capital. So why would you pray? Well, there's another existence. There's another realm. There's another reality that you are, uh, that you are behaving, uh, that you are living in. You know? And that is an action which, at least for that time, the whole, hopefully when we're doing a mitzvah, at least during that time, we're like, okay, there's another reality out there. Right? We sit at the Seder and we eat matzah. Why would we, why would we stop on a, on, a, you know, on a regular school night and say, okay, let's stop for three hours and start eating crackers and read ancient books? Why would you do that? Well, it's a mitzvah. And the mitzvah has value because you are acknowledging that there's this other realm. Acknowledging there's another realm and, and making that a reality, that is emunah. That's what we mean. And it's something which is real, which is tangible, which is palpable, which is alive. It's not something that just, oh, it's an idea that if you ask me in the middle of the night, I'll have to make a decision, yes or no. It's not like a yes or no question. It's a behavioral question. It's, it's what kind of life, what kind of life Am I living? Which is, by the way, when we do charity, when we do kindness, so any mitzvah that we do that we would have done otherwise, you know, a lot of people in the world uh, do kindness, do charity, and their motivation is because, you know, they're good humans. You're, you're investing in the... Yeah, so, so okay, but that's, that's what we think. But there's, I'm saying, a lot of people give charity. A lot of people do good things. You know, there, there is a innate human drive to do good, which is puzzling if we want to uh, ignore the existence of the soul. But put that aside. There is an innate interest in doing good. <coughs> but it, how does that square with what we talked about? Uh, so, my, so what I'm saying is, is that we have an innate interest in doing good, and a lot of us will do good, a lot of us in society at large, but we we'll, won't do good because we're recognizing of this, al- uh, this uh, alternate existence. It means there's a bigger mitzvah to do, or, or, or in this context, we see that there is a, a preference to do kindness because you're living in some other world, or at least temporarily. It means you, could, you have two people doing the same mitzvah for different motivation. I'll give you an example, right? Two guys go to the kosher restaurant. One guy because they have gluten-free, and one guy because they only eat kosher food, and because the Almighty says eat kosher food. One, one because it's free? Because it's gluten-free. It's gluten-free. gluten-free. Right. So the, he's not doing a mitzvah. Right? He's not thinking about the fact that it's kosher right. food. Right. right. It's just, you know, it's just, or it, it's, the, it's the only store that's available. Is he doing a mitzvah? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. It's a good question. But well, when you, you could, you could, you could uh, attach a emuna motivation to every mitzvah. That's my point. Yeah. Does that make sense? I don't want to say it doesn't count, but you put the 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 um, the experience on steroids. You know, when when you do a mitzvah with the correct intent, then you're actually achieving a munah via that mitzvah. But, mm-hmm. but in your hypothetical, Rabbi, did you mean when you said the gluten free thing, you, you didn't even say it was necessarily someone Jewish? In other words, somebody. Yeah, we're talking about someone who's Jewish. Yeah. Let's okay, say, so, you know, but then, or you have the guy who's. I'm not working on Shabbos because I happen to be on bed rest. You know, so they're not experiencing Shabbos. They happen to, you know, they happen to have gotten really lucky and and kind of, right? It's <laughs> you know, I um, I theorized recently. Someone always someone mentioned last uh, last night, not last night, the Friday night that it always rains on Shabbos, always. Like every time, every every single Saturday, like. For the past a couple of months, it's been raining. So I said it's the Almighty's way of trying to encourage Jews to observe Shabbos by making it so appealing, so unappealing to go out. That's my that's that that's my theory. Oh, but you still have to go to temple. Uh, you know, you walk in the rain. You know, oh yeah, so it's 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 a huge hassle. It's a huge hassle for us, right? But you know, but the question is, if someone just gets very lucky and he does what's right, is that's I'm sure that's good. That's better than the alternative. But if you could actually uh, attach a certain motivation to an activity, then you actually achieve a muna. You know, if you know if someone just 
you know, we was giving example of kosher. You just go to the store and give, you just grab whatever meat off the shelf. You're not thinking of doing kosher because that's what, as Jews, we're commanded to do. You know, you, you by chance happen to have been right, but it doesn't really mean much. Yeah, but, like, well, but, like whether you keep kosher or not, just a typical grocery trip, 90% of what you buy is probably going to have the OU that's right. You know, a stamp. On yeah, ninety ninety percent so like, of stuff for kosher. Technically, right now. like most of your kitchen is kosher, but you didn't try for it. Mm-hmm. You don't care. I have a friend who told me that uh, that uh, we know there's a, <laughs> there's a mitzvah from the Torah. A lot, there's a few mitzvahs that um, are um, kind of the the origin of the mitzvah we're told are because these were the ways of the Gentiles, mm-hmm. and if the Jews would do that, then they would become. Uh, assimilated amongst the, you know, it's like for t- a tattoo, like, a, you know, a tattoo is that that was a symbol, it might still today probably is a symbol of deviance. Uh, and uh, I, I asked when I was in Israel a few years ago, a bunch of kids, young people who had tattoos, and I said, I thought it's against the religion to have tattoos. He said, Well, we get it burned off and we die. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they get it burned off? What do you mean? Burned off, burned in hell? No, they get no. it burned off. They laser it off. They laser it off. They laser it, off. They laser they, it, it off. gets t- taken off when they're ready they to be buried. Right. Right. So you mean they ask, they, they intend for somebody to remove it well, after they're dead? I, that's what they yep. said, you know? I wasn't, okay. They put it on with head. Probably were joking. Well, yeah, at first Yeah, so that's that's different. That's not a permanent. I don't know what. No, you can't be buried in a. Well, that's that's a misconception, but uh, it's not true. That's not true. The only person that does not get buried in a Jewish cemetery is someone who was executed by a Jewish court, and uh, those things obviously haven't happened in two thousand years, of course. Um, and uh, even that, even the person that gets executed by a Jewish court, uh, they are only there for a couple of years until they're until they disintegrate, until they're. Uh, till they decompose and then they get exhumed and reinterred really? into it. That's right. That's what the Mishnah says. That's so why is huh? the law really about the? <laughs> what? No, because no, but there's that there's an option. Like even basically like yeah, it's not it's not forever. That's right. It's not forever. So the most vile the whole idea of, of Jewish hell essentially like nobody re- nobody goes and just suffers for all eternity. Like right. you may have to pay it's a penance of some kind for a short period of time. <laughs> But then you get to go on. Right, it's it's not yeah. our way so of it's, in line. it's not our way of intimidating people into faith. But how does that yeah. square? Not to get too much in the weeds here, but how does that square with the resurrection, eventual resurrection of the dead? What about it? You know, so does a Jew that gets put to death for sinning by a Jewish court? And so the mission says like this: all of Israel is a portion of the world to come. All. All of Israel, including however, criminals. Or? However, these are the ones that don't have a portion of the world to come. There are exceptions. For example, the exceptions are someone who doesn't believe in the world to come. So, and the, the Gemara explains that, you know, if you don't believe in it, it's a then okay, you don't want it, you don't get it. <laughs> and, okay. and, and the Talmud goes on to bring about 15 different scriptural sources from the Torah that talk about the, the, the uh, coming back to life, the resurrection of of everyone. Okay. Other people, people that don't believe in the divinity of the Torah, people that are heathens, people, um, the Ram reads a whole list as well. There's a, there's, you know, there's a list, but even people that are sinners and even sinners that sin with such egregious sins that cause them to get executed, they still have a portion of world to come. So even murderers? Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, a, mur- uh, I, small a, murder, I, a murder might be on that list of, of those that are... <laughs> Very I, small. I think so. I think a murder, yeah, because that's that's something that's so. Uh, uh, but so back to what I was saying, right? So we have this a mitzvah not to shave with a razor, right? Certain parts of your face you can't shave with a razor. Uh, for it's a mitzvah for men only. Uh, also, certain parts of your, uh, uh, certain parts of your of your head you can't shave off, like the verse says. Uh, not to make a uh, straight line. It used to be that the Gentiles would all shave over here. Right, that's why and you would have like a connection from your forehead to the back where there's no hair. Mm-hmm. And that's why, the, that's the idea of pe- payas, like the word payas, mm-hmm. it means corners. Because the verse says, don't shave the corners of your head, which is, these are the parts of the corners of your head. Mm-hmm. And some of the religious people say, okay, we're, not only are we not going to shave it, we're going to let it grow out. You ever see people with big payas? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So that's actually not a mitzvah. 
Young kids. Right. Right. Young kids, old kids, right? Uh, all different kinds of kids. <laughs> right? But you see, like, it's in Israel, you see them. Like, the, the Hasidic Jews, they have the, they have the nice twirly ones. Some people have the ones that go behind their ears. Some of them have the really big ones. But either way, yeah. <laughs> but that's actually not a mitzvah. Because the mitzvah is only a negative. Don't shave there. Don't cut it off. But they said, okay, in order to kind of demonstrate our commitment to this mitzvah, not only won't we cut off, we'll actually let it grow out. You know, but uh, it's perfectly fine. Like, I don't have any pass, you know, but I, I think I'm still good, right? Um, well, but are you, but, but I mean, is that just one you get, a, you? you go around? Or I, Obviously, you're good, but I mean, do, do, is that, seriously, is that your interpretation if you don't do it? Or are you... Are no, no, you I, no I, I, I am good in this area. I don't know about everything, but, but either way, so... So, so, you ha- so I, met a, I met a guy, one of my students, I said, we talked about shaving with a razor. He says, oh, I don't shave with a razor uh, since I was 17 because it gave me razor burns or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I said to him, you have an opportunity to say, right, he's 29 years old, so he's been shaving with an electric shaver mm-hmm. for 15 years already, whatever. Um, I said, you have to- instead of saying, I don't shave with a razor because it gives me razor burns, say, I don't shave with a razor because the Torah says no, and then you get a free mitzvah. You're doing it anyhow, right? Yeah. Might as well just cash in, right? Electric <laughs> razor is okay. Yes, electric razor is fine. And who said that? Well, because it's not touching the skin. It's not tar. The tar is the, is the, is the blade razor. There's a blade. Well, there's a blade, but there's a separation. It because is. There's a separation. Touched, La- there's wire between. Huh? What do people That's do? Why you don't get people clean, like the Gemara says yeah. that people could use either they used to use some sort of chemicals or some sort of uh, like nair product yeah. that kind of uh, just burns the hair off. Well, they, the Gemara mentions mean, that or scissors of some sort. If there's a separation between the skin and the blade, then men could use women's razors because they have a wire like the like the fancier ones have like wire guards across Maybe. the blades. Maybe. <laughs> well, you could, I guess I don't know much about Well, and razors, also, so but also, I'm saying it's work. not, I'm saying it's only five, the, like Gamar says that there's five places, five uh-huh. corners of your of your beard, which is wherever the bones connect. So the bones over here, the bones over here, the bones over here. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so, so you can raise it right here. Or your mustache area or here, that's okay. right. But either way, it's free mitzvahs. You know, yeah. so it's not a mitzvah is not necessarily an action that happens to coincide with what the Torah wants. It's an action that that the Torah wants because the Almighty is instructing you, because you are admitting, you you are affirming the existence of this other realm. The fact that the Almighty says to do something matters. You know, uh, and I think it's not just about you know it's not a, a religious thing. You have you know you have people that are religious. Uh, and they would, they're fastidious about doing the mitzvahs, but they don't necessarily think every time they put on tefillin that they're doing a mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I put on tefillin because that's what I do every morning, right? Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it becomes a habit like brushing your teeth as well, right? You don't brush your teeth and say, I'm doing this because I want to have healthy teeth and healthy gums, and right? you don't do that every day, right? You do because it's just, you know, right? It's, it's just, it's just part of your routine. Yeah. And we don't want our religion, which could bring us to a muna, to become routine, because when it becomes routine, you lose the whole value. Yeah, we kind of think it's more. That's right. Mundane. It's exactly yeah, so. It's so that, that's right. So when we do mitzvahs, it's important for us to try to capture the value that we could have in the mitzvah, because we could lose it, you know. And even if we do a mitzvah consistently, it doesn't mean that it always actually, you know, we always are able to, uh, you know, achieve the power that the mitzvah has within it. So that's that, guys. Um, so I, I think that that's, you know, really the starting point of Jewish faith, where we have so many different mitzvahs throughout the day, throughout our lives, throughout the week, throughout the year, that provide us the opportunity to have moments of a certain reality dominating our perspective. Um, we talk about prayer, right? So Jews are obsessed with prayer. Uh, we have three prayers a day, and we have hundreds, a hundred blessings a day, and, you know, and what's the one word that we see more than any other word in the Jewish prayer? Shema. Go ahead, I'm, I'm still listening for the right answer. Still, still, we haven't hit the right one yet? Not yet. I don't know. No, no. Huh? Atta, that's right. That's right. That's the word that's most common. 
right? Why? Because when we pray, this is what we're saying. We're talking to God in first person. That's what it means, you know? Like, what would you say if you had 15 minutes to talk to Obama? You know, I don't know, I don't know, probably, you'll, right? Or uh, whoever <laughs> your political hero is. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, but that, that's the question that we maybe would ask and debate over. But what would you say if you could talk to not someone who's not someone who's not constricted by term limits or by checks and balances? You know, the creator of heaven and earth, the king of, of all kings, who is not bound by any of the restrictions that we have. And we even conceive of talking to him in first person. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that just that thought striking? And that we do multiple times a day, but we go through the, the motions of saying, ah, oh, ta this, ta that, brocha ta this. When re- in reality, like, what Judaism really wants from us is to think about the fact, goodness gracious, you're talking to the Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Wow. You know? And that is the attitude wherein prayer, tefillah, brings about emuna. I could say the words of prayer faster than anyone in this room, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Rapid fire. And does that mean anything? I don't know. It doesn't mean anything. Maybe it means something. It's still a mitzvah, right? But what actually am I accessing? How am I changing? How am I changing my life? I'm not. Yeah. But when we think about this, it's opportunities. And we have hundreds of opportunities a day to <laughs> capture greatness with our mitzvahs. And even when we do that, you know, so there's degrees. You know, so we talk about that's that's what an idea of a mitzvah is from the Jewish perspective. But what, what what else is there? What's next? You know, what would be a stage where okay, we're doing all our mitzvahs fine. You know, and we think about it. We think about the idea that we're talking to God. We think about that we're you know matzah. We're re-experiencing the exodus. Or every time we pass a mezuzah, we feel like there's instructions from the Almighty just standing there, just talking to us, so to speak. What's next? So I think there's a higher level um, when the spiritual reality becomes more real. Um, to give you an example. Back to that conversation we had with the president. You know, if I told you that tomorrow at seven o'clock you have a, a opportunity to talk to the president via Skype or something like that. <laughs> and he's going to be there waiting for you. And you go to sleep and uh, you set your alarm and for whatever reason it was on low, it was on mute, or you had your headphones jack plugged in and you wake up, oh, goodness, it's 8 o'clock, right? PM instead of exactly. <laughs> you have overslept. <laughs> and you oversleep your appointment. <clears throat> and you would be devastated. You know, whatever, who does that? You know, you have a golden opportunity. You miss out. Uh, or, you know, not with the president, or you have, an upper, you have a conference call with your boss or something like that. You don't miss that for nothing. How come when we miss a meeting with God, how come that, we're like, oh, no big deal. It doesn't bother us. But if your boss says, uh, I want to see you in my office in 15 minutes. Oh, goodness, am I going to get fired? What's it going to be? You know? And then you, you get there, you straighten your tie, you brush your teeth, right? What's the deal? The, one feels more real. One feels more real, exactly. So our goal as we really move forward, it's not just to say, to think about when we're doing a mitzvah, okay, this is real. It's to actually feel that it's real. So when you are about to pray, you somehow get the feeling that you're about to talk. God. That's a different prayer. It's, you have to remind yourself. Like, when you're talking to the president, you don't have to say, remember, he's the president. Don't say, like, uh, any bad words or whatever. Or, or don't, you know, you don't have to remind yourself constantly. You do, your mind doesn't wander while you're talking to him because it's real. Why does our mind wander when we pray? Because it's not real. Or not quite real enough, Bruce. But not by guilt, right? Oh, well, no, it's not about guilt. This is about I mean, opportunity. Yeah, no, this is not about guilt. This, this is about opportunity for greatness, which the, the Torah and the Almighty want us to achieve. Absolutely not. This is not about guilt. Um, the threat of not being buried in a Jewish cemetery because of tattoos, that's about guilt. Uh, how do we know that's about guilt? Because that's made up. So we don't Where need to... Where does that come from, though? 
I, I think it was someone very clever who said, hey, all these Jewish kids want to be punks, right? How do we stop them from being punks? Well, let's threaten them with they won't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. <laughs> you know, that just terrifies them. It's it's nonsense. It's, it's in the Torah. Total, uh, no, it's not in the Torah. To be, <laughs> no, it, doesn't it say well, you can't make marks? Well, Torah says don't. Torah says don't have tattoos. Torah doesn't mention that the consequences of that. Oh, being, oh okay. Yes, that's right. Wow. Well, yeah, the, like I said, the Torah does mention that okay, they so that it's the against Judaism. But well, it's not no against penalty. Judaism. I, I like the idea. I, I, I want to know who this person is who made it up and popularized it because I think there's other things we could probably include well, under well, the... Well, you got people with earrings. earrings. You've been over there. What's wrong with people with earrings? That's, you're, you're, you are making a mark in yourself. Making no, it's not a tattoo, right? No, no, I didn't say that, but it, it's still... You know, I'm running it all through your ear to signify that you want to stay with the guy. Yeah, there's slavery. They pierced their ears. But that was a slavery thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Huh? I'm sorry? Well, that's what I mean. Well, what? Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, of course. But you still didn't have, I think you're being pledging yourself to one master, but you're still a slave. Right? You know, just think about what. You can't decide not to be a slave anymore. You could just. What would our Judaism look like if people weren't just terrified of getting tattoos? Like. Oh, if I, uh, I don't know, if I don't work to fill in every day, I'm not going to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. There you go. Maybe that'll work. Let's try to popularize that. I, I, I don't know how to do that, but I'm saying. But it would be the wrong motivation. Of course, at, but yeah. it's no different than, yeah, so we don't do that. I'm like, saying yeah, we don't, like, we don't know, try to guilt people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know those are the wrong words, but like, <clears throat> you don't want to add another thing. No, I think people, people doing for the wrong and reason. I'm saying we mentioned last week that the idea of contemplation <laughs> of your own demise is a very powerful thought. So the thought of what's going to be like when I'm buried, right, that presupposes that I'm dead, right, correct? Yeah. Uh, and so once you're dead, the you don't, get as, you know, enraptured by the thoughts of having a tattoo anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I think if we had the thought of death looming over us at all times, we would behave very differently. You know, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, theoretically, God forbid, right? Mm -hmm. How would you behave today? Probably different than I'd behave if I didn't. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> huh? I said irresponsibly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, go, yeah, I'd go bungee jumping or something. <laughs> Is that right? Is that what you would do? I would, blow off, I would blow off all the boring things I have to do and spend the whole day doing whatever I wanted and hanging out with my kids and eating whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> not even kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you no, 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 Kosher, of course. Kosher, of course, right? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, seriously, it would be queso all day. <laughs> and I'm not going to the gym. <laughs> I wouldn't do my push ups, I'd do something. <laughs> So I give you guys some examples here. <laughs> yeah. Just in case. Yeah, but just in case there was a reversal of decision there. So, you know, we have a Mishnah that tells us that says, I think I might have mentioned this last week, repent the day before you die. And the idea being is that every, if every day you assume you're going to die that day or the next day, then you'll be repenting every day, and that's the way you're supposed to live. You know, you're supposed to it means your life, your values are actualized the way you would behave had you known that, or sh should you know that tomorrow you're going to die. Yeah. So if you say, "Oh, then I'll actually get my life in order," like, and I want to make sure I accomplish as much as I can beforehand. Okay, do that every day and live the life to live life to the max. Either way, anyway, uh, I guess uh, I might have mentioned this. I don't know if I mentioned this. It kind of all runs into my head, but um, so uh, I, I might have for sure must have told you this. I'll say it again. Um, I'm, one of my biggest terrors is repeating content. They're like, oh, okay, won't we'll be lost at all. He's just repeating content. <laughs> yeah? Okay, good. So I'll say it again if you haven't heard it. So I was, um, at the age of 18, I, uh, my grandfather, I was already 90 at the time, almost 91, and he was, he was ill. 
uh, and he was ill, and he had a hard time sleeping through the night. And all the grandkids kind of volunteered every night. Someone else stayed with him to, you know, to let my grandmother kind of be able to rest and to take care of him during the night. Fine. So I was there one night, and I got the opportunity. You know, I'm a light uh, or deep sleeper. I was scared. I would fall asleep, and then he would need me, and then I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to wake up. So I said, okay, I'll just stay up and, you know, kind of leafing through some of the interesting books in the library there. Library, I'm saying this is, it's like a, a room small than the size of the closet with like the living room, dining room. Either way, uh, it was like at two in the morning, or three, or it might have been three in the morning, and my grandfather wakes up and says, is it time to daven yet? Time to pray yet? I say, I say, Saba, it's, it's three in the morning. You still have four hours to pray. Go back to sleep. Go up and sleep, wakes up a half hour later. It's time to pray. I say, Saba, it's 3.30, you know, we've got plenty of time, don't worry, we'll be, right? And then... I see where this is going. Yeah, and, and then he wakes up a half hour later, he's like, okay, I'm going to get up, I'm going to wash my hands, and I'll wait. And I have a 90-year-old man here saying he wants to get up and wait to the daven, and, and it's 4 in the morning. And he gets up, and he washes his hands, and he gets dressed, and he's sitting by his couch with his hands on his knees like this, waiting to pray. And the reason is because he was someone who really believed that he has that opportunity to talk to the Almighty every day. And if you really believe that, and if it's real, and it's not just something that you have to kind of think about, concentrate to make real, but it really is real, how could you sleep at night? How could you sleep any night? You know, it's like the kid the day before Disney, right? You can't sleep. You're too excited. You're too wired. Like, what if I wake up late? You know, if when you have that, when you fly to the, you have an early, early morning flight, right? You, you're terrified you're not going to wake up on time, right? So you set your alarm, you set two alarm clocks, two alarms, and then you wake up beforehand, yeah. right? Why? Because you know you need to wake up for this. That's what it's like. If you're really talking to God, would you not be nervous? More nervous than missing a flight? To miss an opportunity to talk to God? Yeah, of course you would, but we don't believe when we're praying we're doing that. Unless we do believe that, and then you actually have a hard time sleeping, and you know this. And this is this was to me this was like striking because this is real for some people. For us, it's just it's 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 hypothetical. Yeah, okay, you got to remember, you got to think, got to concentrate. But for some people, it's real. And if they're able to do that, like that is a level of amuna where you don't need to be reminded about the fact that this is real. You don't have to concentrate on it. You don't have to try to eliminate other thoughts and concentrate on this matter. No, it, that, that's just what you're doing. I had a friend in Yeshiva who used to wear ties before he went to pray. He used to put on a tie, which was a little bizarre. So I, I asked him, why are you wearing a tie? He said, well, if you're talking to the Almighty, to the, to the president, would you not wear a tie? I'm talking to the Almighty. I'm wearing a tie. I mean, it's not so far-fetched. It's not far-fetched, but, <laughs> but, but to, to me, I was like, oh, wow, he, that's logical, right? <laughs> You know, and but for us, it's it's a, like a religious ritual, you know, mm-hmm. which has no life or meaning to unless we invest in it. And and once we invest, hopefully, we'll kind of move up to the next level where we don't need to be reminded uh, uh, about the fact that it that it's real. We don't need to concentrate. On your grandfather. Okay. What would have been terrible if he did his prayers at five o'clock or six o'clock? And then maybe was able to sleep after that. Yeah, I didn't know there was a set time. Oh, yeah. Part of obsessive compulsive disorder. Come on now. What's, what's the, what's <laughs> the time? Oh, seriously. That's part of it. Uh, there is a time. So the earliest you could pray. The earliest you could pray this morning is about six. Yeah, yeah. So there's actually sun up exactly. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, you kidding? Well, I like, mean, did I'm did, did anyone for a second consider that Judaism is the kind of religion that just says ah, whatever? Yeah. No, I, I didn't know. <laughs> My favorite thing is on, you know, your flight. Supposed to pray at six in the morning. Whenever it's light when the sun is ready to come up, and how half the plane goes to the back and starts praying. Gentlemen, and they were like so excited about the fact that it was almost time, you know. 
He was like pushing his buddy, telling him, hurry up, get up, get up, it's almost time, you know. He's rushing around, getting ready, and yeah, I think that's interesting how badly that you know, we have this. Uh, of it all. We have this innovation called Mincha Ma'arif. Mm-hmm. What's Mincha Ma'arif? So Mincha is the afternoon prayer, Ma'arif is the evening prayer. Right. So there's actually a cutoff by when the end point of the Mincha time is, and after that cutoff is the beginning of when you could daven, and when you could pray the evening prayers. Mm-hmm. So what we invented in America is something called Mincha Ma'arif. Why have to come to the synagogue twice? Let's do two for one, right? It's like brunch. <laughs> That's what we do, right? So you come in right beforehand, and you get the tail end of the Mincha experience, and right afterwards you swoop into Meirev. You don't need to make the synagogue uh, season twice, <laughs> the, uh, appearance twice. That's what we do. Um, because to us, we, like, we want to have as few interactions with this rich, religious experience as possible. So it's, it's, you know, it's a hassle to go to shul, you've got to pray, whatever. That's what we do. Uh, my grandfather, he used to always pray at the earliest Mincha time. So the earliest mincha, maybe today's today's day. So is it astronomical sunrise or? Yes, 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 yes. It's based upon the. The astronomical sunrise is basically an hour and a half before you see the sun coming up. Why would that be so? You saying because the sun, uh, the angle of the sun coming up, the first, the first little teeny bit of light, the angle of the sun. Right. So that would be yes. Right, so we have two. We have two times. We have like the the the, the alota shachar was called, like the first light, and then when we actually see the sun, which is uh, today, uh, seventy five minutes later, something like that. Whatever. I mean, how long do you have after the sun comes up? Uh, well, there's different cutoffs. You know, there's like the ideal cutoff, and then there's like okay, you missed that cutoff. You have till that second cutoff, which is midday, and then if you miss that, you got to dive middle twice. Uh, you missed it. You can catch that. Yeah. <laughs> um. No, see, I, I wasn't being facetious. I was just saying, I was thinking about the fact that if you, if you miss, is there a way to catch up? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so now you asked the question, okay, uh, I want to just kind of take a little side, sidebar note here. Um, so we're trying to get more and more real, make this reality, you know, less of something we need to kind of uh, be able to access, but more like it's just the plain, it's the default status, so to speak. And I think there's some nice side benefits, you know. This fringe benefits of being more real. You say, okay, this is all spiritual, this is all, you know, you know, this is all otherworldly. What benefits do I have here as a human uh, when I make my relationship with the Almighty or my perspective on the spiritual reality more real, or more of what I, how I view the world. So there's this ent- entirely other idea called hashtacha pratit, which means, in English, the way the Almighty treats us. And, you know, you see people say, if the Almighty really exists, let him strike me down right now. And, oh, right? Well, how come the mind does not, it never works like that, right? Um, that's not the way the Almighty works. I think, I think you have to be careful about what you be careful what you wish for. <laughs> okay, but okay, but it means how come the Almighty doesn't show us immediate results, right? Um, and even though we would like that, right? Even though that would obviously tamper with our capacity to choose. You know, if every time you sinned, you got a jolt, you probably would stop sinning, and then the opportunity or the instinct to sin would go away, and thus the benefit of refraining from sinning would have no it would have no purpose, no value. But either way, there's this idea where the Almighty is going to intervene on our behalf. And we talk about uh, the Jewish people, we're going to read this week in the Parsha, they're surrounded by enemies on all sides and they got the water. They're locked in. And they jump in the water and the water splits into 12 walkable trails. And they walk through the trails and then the Egyptians say, we're going to go after them. And they go after them and then they get swamped away. And just, whoa, dramatic miracles. That would be an example of the Almighty intervening on behalf of, uh, of, of people that he, that he feels close to. Uh, you'll say, well, that's thousands of years ago, right? Well, what about today? So we have stories of, for example, I'm saying th- these, are, these are stories that happened in, in recent years. 
where there was this one of the probably the greatest scholar uh, in the Jewish world today. I think that's probably uh, good to establish. So he was studying this really esoteric part of the Talmud that talks about that talks about this 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 the anatomy of a certain grasshopper. And the problem with that is that unless you, you, unless you have a picture of what that looks like, you have a hard time really studying that piece of Talmud. And he's trying to figure out what it looks like, and then a grasshopper jumps on his, on his, tel- on his page. That same one. But is there a coincidence? Maybe. Uh, or it's the fact that someone like that, the Almighty kind of is able to, uh, or the Almighty uh, chooses to treat on, on, a, on a more real way as well. And the, the, secret, the secret to unlocking that kind of treatment is that the more real we are with the Almighty, the more real the Almighty is with us. And to the degree that we're able to upgrade our relationship with Him, He, in turn, will upgrade His relationship with us. They're exact parallels. We determine how real the relationship is. We choose. If, if for us it's theoretical, then for, if, you know, that's what it is. It's theoretical. And theoretically, you could, maybe the Almighty will help you. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Almighty will listen to your prayers. Theoretically, it's a nice theoretical. But when you pray real, when you, make, when you really cry out to the Almighty, so you're obviously choosing to upgrade this relationship to make it more real, then it's reciprocated in kind. We choose exactly how, what's the stat- status of the relationship. I'll give you guys some examples here. The Talmud says as follows. It says, when the temple was destroyed, this is the Talmud in Sota, temple's destroyed, there's no more people of Amuna. Right? Since that time, there is a, it's been downgraded, so to speak. There's no more people of that have real Amuna. What does it mean, a person of real Amuna? Someone who has food in their basket today, but no food for tomorrow, and says, what will I eat tomorrow? That's someone who does not have real amuna. So imagine, you have food to feed your family for today, and you have 38 cents in your bank account. You have no food in your pantry. Your credit cards are all maxed out. You have rent due at the end of the week, and you don't have breakfast to feed your kids tomorrow. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> it's hard to imagine. I'm saying, you know, it's, it's still hard to imagine, but th- let's try to imagine. You, got, you have no money, credit cards maxed out, you have food for tonight, kids are going to sleep, tomorrow morning, they're going to wake up, they're going to be hungry, and you have nothing. Terrifying, right? Says the Talmud, if you are worried for a second, what am I going to eat tomorrow, you don't have real faith. A man of real faith, what do you mean? The money will feed you, right? But imagine your dad was a billionaire, right? And one night you're you're rummaging through your the pantries and in the house that you live in in this magnificent mansion, and you're looking for food. There's no food, and you, there's no butlers around, and you're hungry. And you know, so you go to sleep hungry. But for a second, do you consider that tomorrow there won't be food? You look, the pantries are empty, right? Well, why are you not worried? Because your dad's a billionaire, right? They'll find a way, right? The Almighty, obviously, is more than a billionaire, right? Of course. And the verse tells us that we are the Almighty's kids. Bonim atom Hashem l'keichem. You are sons to the Almighty God. If, if you're finishing a, a Holocaust book yesterday, I can understand where people are worried about the next meal the next day. That's, I'm saying that's... <laughs> You know, that's a good question. How do you have faith in times of... Well, I mean, there may not be. That's true. Uh, but if, if, you know, if, if we are concerned about what we're going to eat tomorrow, what does that demonstrate? That demonstrates that we don't really believe that dad's a billionaire. Right? We don't really believe that. And if you don't really believe that, what happens? He doesn't really treat you like that. know that your father has all this stuff but that he's going to share it with you but why would, which dad doesn't share their food with their kids because if you look all over the world there are so many people who are now hungry and every time you have a tornado or something you throw your houses into the dry your job's gone there's no food 
But Debbie, are most people who are hungry all over the world, there's not tornadoes and floods every day, so yeah. there may be some other reason they're hungry. Isn't Just because in, in a lot of places, there isn't the food to go around. But this, know, is, this, is precisely my, this is my, precisely my point. Mm -hmm. My point is, is that, yes, our dad theoretically is a billionaire. But having a theoretical billionaire and having a real billionaire dad is very different. Correct? Right. How do we change, so to speak, the status of his treatment of us to make it more real when we view it to be more real? So, for example, what would happen to the guy in yesteryear who didn't have food for tomorrow but wasn't worried about it? What would happen the next day? He'd be hungry the next day. Uh, no. no it the Almighty on... will feed him. Well, How who, who would... would feed him? The Almighty. Okay. Now, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, it's a little bit lengthy. We'll just, you know, just bear with me here. So we have, we actually discussed this Talmud a while back here. There's a Talmud that asks the question, should people work or not? So the first opinion says that you look at the Shema. It says, Shema says, you gather in your grain. Well, what does it mean to gather the grain? It means you're a farmer. It means you gather the grain. What do you mean? How can you be a farmer? We have to study more Torah, right? Well, you have a balance, right? Healthy balance where you study Torah, but then you you know you have to you have to plant and you have to plow the field and you have to harvest and you have to right winnow it and grind it and make food and etc. You have to have some sort of balance. That's the first opinion of the Talmud. Comes along Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says, "What do you mean? You'll 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 have to." Plow and plant and harvest and winnow and when will you study Torah? Right? Torah, what's gonna to be with it, right? So the Talmud says, so instead what should you do? Study Torah. Well, who's gonna feed your family? Don't worry, the Almighty will feed your family, right? When the Jews are doing the will of the Almighty, the work will be done by someone else. But if they're not doing the will of the Almighty, the work will be done by themselves, and not only that, the work of others will be done by them. That's the argument in the Talmud. So first opinion is Rabbi Ishmael. He says, you've got to have a balance comes with Rabbi Shimon, and he says, what do you mean? Study Torah, don't worry about that. The Almighty will take care of you. Okay, so let's, let, let, me, let me finish. Okay. And the Gemara concludes, you know, with a, well, which one's right? Which, which policy should we follow? So it says, Abaya, a lot of people tried to do like Rabbi Shimon, and were successful. Right? A lot of people tried to have this balance, and were able to do it. A lot of people tried to do like Rabbi Shimon and say, I'll study Torah and let the Almighty take care of it, and we're unsuccessful. Which, if you, you know, you see some Talmuds, you see that whenever we have an argument and there's a resolution, it's a resolution based upon halacha. Mm -hmm. I'll quote a verse or something like that and say, oh, the verse says, etc. I'll quote a Mishnah or quote some sort of reasoning. Mm -hmm. This seems to be a data-driven conclusion. Mm -hmm. A lot of people tried this way, it worked for them. A lot of people tried that way, it didn't work for them. Thus, the way that it was successful for most people is the way we should go, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the success ratios. That's not the way the Talmud uh, adjudicates disagreements. Mm -hmm. What's going on over here? The answer is like this. Rabbi Shimon is telling you, what's he telling you? He says, study Torah and let the Almighty worry about everything else. That's a nice thing. A lot of people tried it. Mm -hmm. Most of them didn't work. Why not? Why did it not work for most of them? Maybe because they're not fulfilled. They're not, they're not acting on what they're studying. And they're not, okay, well, what, they're not acting well, on what they're I studying? I guess, and I'm not to jump the gun, but, but I mean, I'm thinking, isn't there something in the Torah that says if you shall not work, you shall not eat, or something like that? Doesn't um, it say that somewhere, or something, words to that effect? I think it's something that's on the Bible. That the man who doesn't work doesn't oh, that's not in, in the that's not It's in a Gemara. There's a famous Gemara that says the, he who toils before Shabbos eats on Shabbos. He who does not toil before Shabbos, what's he going to eat in Shabbos? Is that what you're referring to? I guess. I couldn't remember where, it, where, where in the scriptures it is. But, but I mean, if you, if you, I think it means it's a, syn it's a synonym. It's usually. It's something evangelicals quote all the time as biblical support for um, cutting back on welfare. 
Oh, yeah? Yeah, okay, basically. But, but I, it I is. wasn't even and, re referring but, but to that. But, but no, but that's where it is. And I don't know if it's in Proverbs or if it's something from the New Testament, but it's, t it's, oh, a, it's a scripture that's typically quoted <laughs> by Christians who are trying to justify cutting back on welfare and social security. But benefits. I think I've heard, I thought it was in our scriptures. I, if well, it's if in it's Proverbs. In Proverbs. If it's yeah. in Proverbs, then it's Old Testament. Um, yeah, and I, I think it may be in Proverbs, but that's what you're thinking of, like however it's phrased. Okay. And, and that's generally why. Well, and I'm, and I actually, because I feel like where you're going with this is this idea that if you focus on God and you focus on Torah and your your heart is in the right place and you're doing it and you're doing it because you believe that God is real, then God will honor that and take care of you in a very real way. Like, is that the point that you're making? Like even when it comes down to tangible things like food and material goods. Yeah, yeah I'm saying theoretically. Right. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Right, so that's what you're trying to say, which that's, that's, a, that's a lovely idea. Okay. Um, I have some beef with it. Go um, ahead. One, from because, because that thinking leads to sects of ultra-Orthodox Jews who study Torah all day and yeah, have 15 children living on food stamps, which I'm not cool with. Um, that thinking leads to sects of ultra-Orthodox Jews who study Torah all day and don't have jobs and don't do military service in Israel, which a lot of people have some beef with. And I also feel like if you take that thinking beyond food and material goods, you end up in situations where people are facing death and really trying situations that are bigger than day-to-day -day needs. And you, people can end up in a place where they think, okay, I have faith in God. I believe I'm doing this and doing this and doing this. God's going to save my child. God's going to save my father, whatever. And then in the end, the person dies anyway. And it, can cre it sets people up for a crisis of faith that I think could be avoided if you didn't attach yourself to that mentality. Because when that happens, you're at a point where you either have to say, um, okay, I, I did everything, I was faithful, I did everything I thought I was supposed to do, and God is sovereign, and, you know, he's the true judge, and mm -hmm. he does as he pleases, and that's that, which is the tack that I choose to take, but it's the other side of that coin is I did everything I was supposed to do, I believed that God would take care of me, and God screwed me. Mm -hmm. God okay, didn't okay, so that's and a, then that's that rattles people. But if you don't cling to this idea that if I do it right, God will be God will handle it for me. Like if you can if you can hold that as a lovely idea, but not cling to it as truth, then you save yourself a whole lot of misery and drama. Okay, so um, there's one crucial part of this Talmud that it seems that uh, would be omitted mm -hmm. uh, if that attitude would be in practice today. Um, what does it say? Mm -hmm. So. You remember at the beginning of that piece of Talmud, it said that from the time the temple was destroyed, there's no more people of faith. Correct? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Do we just post the post the temple being destroyed or pre the temple being destroyed? Both. That's right. So what's it telling us is that people of no, faith nobody, don't exist. Nobody now could possibly have enough faith to get that kind of. That's right. That's that's, that's what it means. It means yeah. that for us today to say that we don't have food for tomorrow, but God will take care of us, mm -hmm. we can't do that. And not only that, we, can't be, we haven't been able to do that for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So for someone to take that Talmud or that perspective and try to have that govern their behavior, mm -hmm. that's silly, right? Because the Talmud already declares, like for thousands of years already, remember we believe in a de degrading spiritual capacity as time goes on, mm -hmm. right? And, and therefore, for someone to take that Talmud and to try to use that uh, as a perspective to govern their behavior today, that's silly because the Talmud already declares it's not possible anymore. You know, mm -hmm. once Talmud destroyed, there's, there's been a significant downgrade in kind of the spiritual nature of the nation of, and of the individuals. Is that for someone to live by that irreparable downgrade? Well, who knows what's irreparable? But, but, that, but we're, we're if it's irreparable. Why are we even here? Like, why, 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 why try and survive? I mean, why, why, why do anything if, if we're? To, you're almost saying it. It's like yeah, they're saying we're damned. Now. But the point. But your question. But your question only. Your question only. Uh, your question only uh, is troubling, if our life is based upon the uh, qualitative or, or, or quantitative results. Yes, we can never capture the levels of prophecy of thousands of years ago. 
But with the idea of free will is that we're always judged at the point where we are. So it doesn't matter what the level of our soul is. Doesn't, that the point doesn't matter. The point is, what do you do with what you're given, with the choices that you're, that, that you're presented with? So we have, Maimonides tells us, okay, Maimonides obviously knew this Talmud, correct? We assume that. He tells us every human, doesn't say Jew, every human is like, can be like Moses. Which we know, the Talmud says, we, we can't have any prophets anymore. We, Talmud says that since the temple was destroyed, we can no longer be men of faith the way the Talmud understands it. Obviously, we can't be like Moses. Correct? But and you're saying, whoa, if we can't be like Moses or we can't be like those great people, then what value does our life have? Well, the answer is, is that we can be like Moses in respect to actualizing what we can be. Yes, in absolute numbers, we can never achieve the levels of faith of yesteryear or the levels of prophecy, which, by the way, is a level of faith. We'll get to that in a little bit. One of the next levels of faith is going to be, le- uh, is going to be prophecy, which, obviously, like we said, it's, not, it's theoretical for us. Uh, the idea still makes sense to us. Uh, but does that mean we can't be great? No, because what, how is greatness defined? By doing the best within the situation that the Almighty placed you in. So if the Almighty may get, uh, said that you no longer have this great level of faith, does that mean you can have whatever level of faith you are capable of having? So you, if you just make the best of it, you strive towards perfection and you get excellence, or, or close to it, which is not bad. Or strive towards maximizing your opportunities, right. whatever that may be. Yeah. And if those opportunities, in absolute numbers, you'll never be like Moses, doesn't mean that you can't be as great as Moses. Right. Uh, so, 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 yes. So, uh, to someone to justify their behavior based upon this attitude would be very, very difficult. Um, because the Talmud already says that this is not going to be, um, this is not going to be uh, something that we can have anymore. Now, for me to judge someone on how many kids they, they should ought to have, uh, is also uh, 15 kids. I, I'm saying I'm not going to begrudge someone for having well, 15 kids. You have 15 but, kids, well, but you need to feed your 15 exactly. kids. Exactly. Like, yeah, you can't have to, like, and I think it's, it's, it's one thing if, if you fall on hard times, uh, but it's another thing to say, oh, I'm, I'm never going to have a job that can pay to support my family, and I'm just going to keep having kids. Like, that's some well, I think I think there's I think there's a difference. Be- I think I, I I may agree with you. I'm not sure yet, okay. but I think that for someone to say in absolute terms yeah. that unequivocally someone that does not have a financial plan how to pay for their kids, right. they shouldn't have kids. Right. Now, right. okay, but let me ask you a different I'm question. Like, I don't have a paying job, and I'm never going to have a paying job. But I'm. But just let me ask you a different question. Let me ask you a different question. Should unlike. that also prevent someone from having one kid? Not plan, but just you don't have the plan now. Who knows what happens in the future? It means no, we, no, it's very no, easy no, to no, judge no. someone who can't afford 15 kids, no, 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 but it's hard to judge someone that you know, had one, two kids, right, that we're okay with, right? And I find no, okay. that if, if, if people had a financial plan in place or if people only had kids, once they were sure they could pay for it, our society no, no, no. would no, rapidly that's, evaporate. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, so the question is, why, why stop, why say only 15 is irresponsible, but one, that's responsible? No, the irresponsible is, I don't have a job and I'm never going to have a job. Who, well, who says they're never going to have a job? That, People that, who say that they're going to just study all day long can, and not get paid for it. Can I jump in because I find this fascinating. This is fascinating. And, and <laughs> first of all, I didn't know, I'm sure it exists, I didn't know that there were the kind of communities you're talking about. Well, doing, I, I don't I know about that either. I each other. I didn't think they were on food stamps. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, that, well, I'm not just... It, well, actually, you see it um, in a lot of religious groups. They're like, and it's, I mean, it's stuff, not, not people I know, but stuff I've read about online, mainly right. debates about this exact idea. I, I don't doubt and their it's example. some very, very ultra-Orthodox ultra, ultra um, sects, um, I, I want to say around New Jersey, um, kind of up in that area. There's some debate about that, and there's debate about it also in Israel, and then you see the same thing happening, particularly in Mormon communities. Okay, and, yeah. Like, okay. Well, th- I, I mean, there there are lots of the there are lots, I mean, there are the, lots of religious well, this, people who who have that mindset. But this don't you think that the, the, they're providing a service to the rest of us to give us okay, uh, well, taxpayers, future taxpayers? What I think is a unless, crucial unless they need to fucking get down the line. Like, like, working, no, but who says the kids are not going to work? Right? They they might, we have a big problem in our country where where everyone's living longer. 
no offense, I'm saying that's a yeah, good thing, right? Yeah, so Living longer yeah. and no one's yeah. paying for it because we're not producing as many babies as we can. Yeah. Okay, but right? isn't yeah. there, that's a problem. Isn't yeah. there a difference? Yeah. We'll be like Japan. That's right. Yeah. It's terrible. And I have no beef with people who have lots of kids. It's just, it's that idea of I don't work and I'm never going to work. Which is which is an attitude that right. I think is much it's less common than what I'm. Very small. Well, it's okay, very small. so okay, fine. So then, but. so then, you know, for us to, to 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 you know to get on our high horse and start judging people that we've well, never well, met. Wait a minute. What I'm saying uh, is, isn't <laughs> no, that an no, attitude no. anti-scriptural? Because isn't there a difference between studying Torah and doing Torah? If the Torah says you're supposed to work. And some orthodox scholar says, well, I'm going to study it all day so I can't work. Right. Aren't they violating the Torah? Aren't right. they, they're hypocrites yeah. or, the, or a very distorted interpretation right. of what the Torah says. The says. only reason I bring it up but who, is because... But, but, but wait, wait a minute, slow down. But who says the Torah says you should work? It, it, does. it doesn't. Like, we, like, basically, you just clarified, like, once we got the whole picture, because the whole picture from you is, yes, we have this one idea that... Um, that you theoretically could like go all in on God in the midst of his Torah study and make it so real that God provides everything else for you. Yes, theoretically. And then, theoretically, the, when we started this conversation, we did not have the follow-up piece, which was, yeah, great idea, but nobody was going to have that kind of faith, so it's never actually going to happen. Well, so nobody since the temple was destroyed. Stuff. Right, but I mean, I mean, that's reality, is nobody at this point in time. Um, hasn't happened, not going to happen anytime soon. And so when we started this discussion, we didn't have that follow-up Well, we piece. did, but it kind of was forgotten about. I, I, I didn't mention well, it. But. I, I, I hadn't heard it okay. at that point in time. <laughs> um, and so we didn't have this follow-up piece. So I think the two things taken together are fine. Like mm-hmm. if you, you, we've got this one piece that, that gives you this idea. Yeah. Okay, but, let, but let me throw in another curveball like, here. So you said there's a mitzvah to work. And by the way, you know who would agree with you? Maimonides, right? Maimonides has diatribes in several places about the people that but say... I thought, God, because you just said something about Sabbath, the, the one who toils before the Sabbath has will never be hungry or something like well, that. No, that's no, true. no. Well, that's actually referring... That actually is a Talmud masking an idea about Olam Haba in Friday afternoon cooking, mm-hmm. which is a, you know, an example of how the Talmud would take a very deep idea and present it in a way that may be misunderstood you know, like, oh, if you made food before Shabbos, you could eat on Shabbos. Wow, fantastic, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a lesson about Friday cooking, right? Shabbos mm-hmm. cooking. It's not, it's not a cookbook, right? What it's really saying is that Olam Abba is a time where you can't work, right? Once, you, once you're dead, right, you lose the opportunity to do mitzvahs. So our life in this world is akin to Friday. We've got to prepare, 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 prepare. Mm-hmm. And then the next world is like the Shabbos where you're just it's consuming what you prepared, mm-hmm. right? So... We have to, our mitzvahs are like making food that are, that are consumable mm-hmm. in Lama Ba when it's, when it's only spiritual, right? Every mitzvah is a recipe for food that is only consumable on Shabbos, so to speak. Mm-hmm. That's what it's saying. Um, but... Oh, so he says about work. So he says, he, so he says, he goes on and on and on and how terrible it is. You know, it's, it's probably a good thing to read once. Uh, once in, in, in Yad Chazakra, in his commentary on the Mishnah, if you look at his commentary on the Mishnah on the, uh, on the Mishnah and chapters of the Fathers, that says, don't make a Torah. Don't, don't take Torah and make it a crown to be glorified or a shovel to dig with, right? We don't take Torah for our own benefit. So he rails against people that say, I'll study Torah and people will honor me, people will give me money, people will pay for me, right? That's not what, he, that's not, that's not what the Torah wants. That's what he says. But even he says that everyone should work and there's nothing better than, than, than being able to support yourself with your, own, with your own labor, with your own handiwork, and there's nothing worse than having someone pay for your Torah study. And then he says, well, how much should you, know, how much should you work? How much should you study? He says, well, you have 12 hours a day to do study and work. He says, you study nine hours a day and work for three. That should he be enough. He does cite time frames. Yes, he, he says that should be enough. Well, he gives us an example of something else, but he says, when well, we're supposed to study, we're supposed to study a third of this, a third of this, and a third of that. So you're supposed to do study nine hours, which is typical, of course. You work, you got to work for three hours. By the way, sp- speaking about this, I did some research recently. How much time does the average American actually deal with work-related issues? Like, how much work actually do we go through the day? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're like, hey, you go to work nine to five, but like you're, you're watching some YouTube videos, or I'm you're on Twitter, or whatever. Meetings that are nonsense. Yeah. And you gotta have lunch break, right? Yeah. 
the average American actually works for two hours and 59 minutes, actual work time. Mm-hmm. You know, with Maimonides, we're not going to waste a second. He actually hit it exactly on the head. We actually have three hours of real work. Everything else is just nonsense. And then instead of wasting all that other time, we can actually study, and then we'll have nine hours of study. That's what he said. Okay, so, 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 so these people but it's the average that American. Andrea is citing are not following Maimonides' teachings. Well, I don't know. I, I've never met any of these people. These people are... are, are the, you know, maybe there's some people like that in Israel. I think they, they, this does exist. But to me, I look at those people as, as heroes because these are the people that are willing to forfeit some of the... Uh, some of the um, kind of the uh, amenities of the physical world for us, for our nation. You know, this is what makes, gives us the ability to, like, you know, we're safe and secure in Houston, Texas, because there are people that are toiling in Torah study. Like, that's what we believe. Now, you say like this, is it unhealthy? Could it get unhealthy? Of course it could. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and misdirected martyrdom. Like, you think you're a martyr, but really you're just, you're mistaken, you're a fool. That, that could happen. Now, I think that once we're telling people not to have kids, you know, once we're already on that, uh, well, uh, I, maybe not, we I'm should also tell people. About that yeah, okay. Yeah. But, uh, that was not my goal. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But, uh, but, then, but at the same time, like, that is something that bothers me. Like, it bothers and, me too. Well, and, well, and, uh, I mean, and, not, and not, just, not just very large families. And, 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 well, and this is, I guess this is just a personal beef. Like, I, I've got friends who just have, like, three or four kids. And I can I can look at them and I can see that number nobody pays attention to number four and number four has gotten a love and number four has never had new clothes and like there's nothing wrong with that but well, it makes me sad I will always feel sad about that and I will yeah, always but hate that unfairness I, I, towards number four I I think so that that's, I think sometimes there's, there's number one who doesn't isn't yeah. adequately taken care of they say okay here's an Xbox yeah. and here's a television. And go be educated. Yeah. Go be educated by uh, clash of clans or whatever, right? Yeah. Well, okay, but yeah. what's the point of it? If you talk, I just don't understand it. I got eight kids. Oh. I got fifteen grandkids. I'm very happy. Oh no, I'm, I'm not a, saying anything. I never got good unhappy. education. I worked butt all my life. Yeah. I came from no, from hell. Uh-huh. I never complained. I just yeah. thank Hashem for what He provides. Yeah. And you're probably your kids are probably not on food stamps either. No, but everyone was learned how to work. Great, right. that's what I think. Right. Well, and what I, what I was upset about was was the idea that people could use this. But idea. I think it's well, well, it's, well, um, it's a it's it's perpetrator. Go ahead. Correct. Sorry. What bothered me was that I felt like the idea we were taking out of the Talmud could be used as justification to never work. And, well, and, there, and there are people who, who use it that way. There are people in Jewish communities. There are people in Christian communities. There are people out there who take that idea, and they don't have the corollary that supports yeah. it. The corollary that, that comes back up and makes it make sense, that stops abuse, I think. Like, if you, if you take that idea that if I just focus on God all the time and don't worry about anything else, then everything will be provided for me. People take that very literally without the corollary that the amount of faith it would take to make that true in a miraculous level is something we'll never actually achieve. And so I, I feel like I'm getting confused with what I'm talking. But yeah. basically that first idea should not be used as justification to not work and not teach your children to work and to not take steps to take care of yourself on your own. So if you're going to believe that, that you still take steps to take care of yourself on your own, more power to you, have as many kids as you want, I'll never have a beef with you. If you take that idea and then you do nothing and you teach your children to do nothing, then I think you're wrong. But, okay, so I have a, a, a few more responses here. So first of all, I think that this narrative, like we said, you even you even agreed it's a very small percentage, it's very but it's it's tiny, it's tiny, amplified it's by a certain narrative. Idea. It's it's this idea without the corollary. Okay, but I think so, I think that there's a bigger problem, uh-huh. um, in, in a much bigger uh, uh, pool, where people are not having enough kids because they're terrified of the financial implications, or because they don't want it to disrupt their career or their their fun, right? Yeah. And yeah, then, and especially the people that are most successful. And have probably the best genes mm-hmm. are the ones that are not actually replicating that mm-hmm. 
And that's unfortunate. At least I'm our kids. So what is the society? That's a problem too. It's, that's extreme. That's number, number two. But also, I think that there's that there's a healthy, uh, there, or there's the capacity to try to have. Like I'm number six, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, could I argue that maybe I was a little bit to kind of put on the certain uh, uh, conveyor belt, so to speak. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. maybe. Uh, but thank God, you know, my parents uh, were they never were wealthy, and and I think that if they had the attitude of like, uh, you know, let's first have a financial plan in, in place mm-hmm. before we have any more kids, you know, yours truly might not he- be here. You know, who knows, yeah. right? Yeah, well, and really, like, this this discussion we've gone off into is not something I ever truly <laughs> intended to, like, no, argue yeah. about. Because the, when I started talking, my, my core focus was that single idea causing... Yeah, but we think about this. But 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 what's but what's what's the other option? The other option is is that no one has this idea, and no one kind of jumps in to having a big family without knowing how they're going to pay for it all. And then if everyone has small families, well, society at large suffers as well because it's possible for someone to jump into having a big family, find a way to make it work, right? Pull those extra jobs and find a way to make it work. And then having the benefit of the back end, we're a, a burgeoning society and a burgeoning economy as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for us in, a, in our community, like we're always building. Mm-hmm. And if we say that uh, you know let's let, let's have one point two kids, mm-hmm. you know, a garage and a dog and a pool, yeah. right? No, that I mean, means that our our that our growth will hit the negative, right? That's what will happen. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and I never intended to have this turn into a discussion on the number of kids. I actually, it's, it's funny because I have a. That's, uh, not, that's <laughs> like not. I did not intend to argue about yeah, that but your, at all. Your point it's is primarily by, not being a burden to society. It that's, is. That's, that's, that's yeah. Right. Basically, right. like right. like my my <laughs> main my main point <laughs> is don't use um, a faulty religious idea to put yourself at risk or make yourself or jeopardize. Yeah. Okay. Fine. That, I think like, that's fair. When this whole thing started. That that was what yeah, I. Yeah, and you also mentioned the army. Yeah. But correct yeah, me so if I'm the wrong, truth wasn't go ahead. the origin of this whole discussion we've had when you made the comment that um, if you have faith, you will never be hungry? Right. Right. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say <laughs> no, that. I, well, no, I, I said okay, if, if you really acted in a way that demonstrated that you really live by the principle that God's your billionaire dad, God will treat you in kind. That's all I've said. Now, what does that mean? That means when you go to sleep. No, they don't. For example, they go to sleep. (laughs) They go to sleep at night where there's no food for tomorrow. Yeah. Are they nervous? That's the that's the question. I don't know if they're no. I'm I'm going to make the claim that no one today exists that would have no food and no plan to feed their kids tomorrow. They'll be able to sleep through the night. That's my point. If you're able to sleep through the night, that demonstrates that you really have no concern. Uh, Maybe crazy people, but that's not faith. No, but but I mean, well, I think they're crazy, but they think they're faithful. <laughs> yeah, but if they feel like they're I mean, faithful, but, that's what it is. but, like, they but, but even if you feel, let's say assume you feel you're faithful, crazy. you feel you're faithful. I have faith, right? If you have to even say that you have faith, that means you don't have faith. It means they the point is they just say God will provide. They say I'm not worried about it because God will provide. Which is a way of saying, what's the, what are they what's really saying? They're basically saying they have faith that God will provide. Right now, to make a claim to really say that I have faith in God. Right? That demonstrates that you don't really believe that, right? When the kid says, goes to sleep, and he's comforted by the fact that he'll have breakfast tomorrow morning, it's not like they have faith. That, that's just the life that they live. It means you don't have to say you have faith in God when you actually live like that. Rabbi Shimon, right, when, he, when he's advocating for someone is that they wouldn't worry what they're going to eat tomorrow. They won't even have to say, oh, God will provide, because it's so self-understood, mm-hmm. right? It, it's axiomatic that yeah. God will provide, because of course God will provide. They don't even need to say that. But it doesn't really matter. Because it doesn't really happen. It doesn't because exist. Because nobody after the destruction of the temple has had enough faith to make it happen. That's right. But I do... And that's the, that's the I, part I agree. Well, I, or to, to this extreme. Yeah. However... Yeah. Go ahead. Well, there's another Orthodox Jew. Uh, go ahead. You're sounding like... And I admire it. You may not... You know, <laughs> uh, now, she's not a Torah scholar, but and you don't hear her much anymore. But Dr. Laura always said, if you... Do, you know, don't have kids if you don't want to. If you don't, if you can't, if you don't want to afford them, or you don't want to raise them. That's uh, I think that's know. fair. And, uh, you know, we don't want neglected kids, correct? No, obviously. Well, and that's, well, I think that's like, and huh? and it's been, Dr. and honestly, it's been Fletcher. Christians, like the people I've known face to face who lived like that. They were Christians, mm-hmm. and they. 
firmly believed that, and they had neglected malnourished children. And, and, and I just cannot tolerate that. And so, yeah. So, but as you say, yeah, okay. I was born in that family. Yeah, I think no that's a different circumstance. Oh, so. so you're making some consensus. Well, there is, there's a difference between being born. I was malnutrition. I was human skeleton. I was so much laying on the table. They operated right. on me. And then afterwards, the war, the Russians came. It won't be for some person who give their own life uh -huh. to help me. I would be dead. Right. But I think there's a difference between having that happen in horrible circumstances that are beyond your control and somebody who's living in humble Texas with all the freedom and resources in the world at their disposal mm -hmm. choosing it. But that they shouldn't I think there's a difference. But there. there's no child should go hungry. I, no, I believe that. No. That's not but, what she's saying. I know, but saying. still. But but like you you were you were through a terrible situation. Wonderful. Because you were I love in horrible it. circumstances beyond your control. You had no freedom, you had no resources, you had no opportunity. Right. And whenever people are in that circumstance, I would never fault them anything that they do. My problem is people who are free, who have resources, and who have opportunity, and who choose to ignore them. Okay. We do have a hard time. So it's off here. Yeah. So, uh, Rabbi, you want to uh, yeah, so I, I didn't even get to finish. Most <laughs> it's great. I love it. It's oh, great. Great. I'm actually I'm actually planning and telling anyone about this. But I'm planning to give a class on uh, the Jewish perspective on uh, on procreation. Uh, it means the first mitzvah in the Torah, right? You know, I have some some thoughts about the issue, so maybe we could re re. <laughs> <laughs> gotta make sure we have you there, right? We gotta re yeah. reinvestigate this issue. But either way, the point that I wanted to say was as follows. Rabbi Shimon is saying something that most people obviously were un incapable of achieving even then. A lot of people tried to do it, it didn't work. What about him himself? What, what stories do you know about Rabbi Shimon himself? Um, so the Talmud tells us in, in Shabbos 33b that Rabbi Shimon uh, was, he made a snarky comment about the Romans. Uh, where they were having a discussion with the Romans, uh, what to do, uh, what's, the, what, what, how, what's our attitude towards the Romans? So uh, he said something negative about them. They said, oh, you said something bad about the Romans, we're going to come, we're going to kill you. So he was running away from them, trying to escape them. He ended up in a cave, him and his son, uh, in a cave. And they went to the cave, they said, okay, we're going to hide out over here. And the next morning, there was a stream of water and a carob tree that just randomly peered up, uh, you know, popped up. Uh, right, uh, right next to where they were staying, and that's what they sort of stained themselves for the next twelve years. And my question is like this: When Rabbi Shimon went to sleep at night in that cave, right, he knew obviously that he's going to have to feed himself tomorrow, him and his son, right, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Eliezer, right, uh, Rabbi Elazar. Why, uh, why would he go to sleep without a plan for tomorrow? The answer was he had a plan, and that plan was what his billionaire dad would take care of him. And to him, I'm sure he was able to sleep just fine uh, throughout the night. Because he really lived the kind of way of life that he professed that we ought to live, and that is that if we truly treat God in a, in a, in a certain way, he too will treat us uh, back in the, same, in the same manner. And to him, I'm sure he wasn't surprised when he found breakfast tomorrow morning. It wasn't like, whoa, miracle, right? If it's a miracle, it's obviously not the way. I mean, if, if, if your mom gives you cereal, it's not a miracle, right? Right? I'm saying sometimes if the kids eat the cereal, it doesn't spill, so that's a miracle. <laughs> It hasn't happened yet to us. <laughs> uh, but it's not a miracle, right? It's not miraculous. If, if your attitude towards God is that they, he's your parent who loves you, the fact that he actually treats you like a parent who loves you is not a miracle. So that, that's my point. And, of course, to reach that, people of men of real faith, that, that's something we can't reach. But it doesn't mean that we can't upgrade our status. And maybe God will treat us a little bit more real, like the bratty kids, kids that we are, uh, it, may, it won't be exactly the same like Rabbi Shimon was. We can't just say, oh, I don't worry about it. My dad's a billionaire. Why should I go work as an accountant making $45,000 a year? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, but it could still be on a higher level than it is. So my, my point is, is that as we move up these steps, right, our, we upgrade our relationship with God. It uh, benefits to us because our prayers are more effective, right? We're really talking to the king. Otherwise, we're just we're engaging in a, in a religious ritual of lip service uh, that doesn't really impact anything. We pray; doesn't really mean anything. 
But if we are really talking to someone who has power, well, then that actually could bear fruit. So if we upgrade our prayer from being something that we just say without thinking and we are able to channel a certain attitude of, of realness towards that, then the benefit will be uh, in kind. That's the idea. There's some other examples. One of them about the lottery. I guess we'll get to it, get to it next week. Um, but either way, um, we, we saw a, a little bit about what it means to have Jewish faith. Uh, number one, it's when you do mitzvahs and you actually think about that this is a mitzvah from God. It's not just a good deed or a good mannerism or a good behavior that you want to do. And then you can even upgrade it to an even higher level where you don't even have to concentrate and think about it. It's just real. It becomes more real. And we'll see there's much more levels of realness that we can get. Uh, five more levels. Of course, uh, along the way, we'll pick up prophecy and we'll pick up Alam Abba and we'll pick up all the wonderful things and we get to the top mountain. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do it in the time allotted. I'm beginning to <laughs> be skeptical that we'll be able to do it, but uh, either way, it's getting more lots controversial. Of, later, lots right? of fun, yeah. uh, and thank you all for coming, guys. Well, this I'd was like wonderful. to hear your procreation thing at some point. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm hey. planning on uh, discussing it sometime soon. Thank you so much, Kathy. Mm-hmm.